Welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel. And today I'm just going to have a very relaxed discussion with you about differentials and some other topics as they tie in to calculus. Also take a little bit uh, of a look at the history and how uh, these ideas came together. So in the previous in the previous video I talked about what is a differential in calculus. So today I'm going to discuss differentials a little bit more. So let's begin. Now, uh, really, if you're able to understand the concept of rise over run, that's just about all you need to know in order to uh, understand calculus because uh, rise over run is what calculus, differential calculus is all about. And I'll get to that in a second, but what does this really tell us? Well, in ancient Greece, when they thought about slope or inclination, they thought about it in a certain way, right? They thought about it in terms of right angles, right angles. So, for example, um, this particular angle is a certain proportion of a given right angle, okay? So, it's a proportion. Um, it, this here would be a right angle, and perhaps this here is half of a right angle. So, we would say one right, ang one right angle divided by two, right? Okay. So, just let me get rid of that. Okay. Oops, now I want to go back there. Now, uh, the Greeks thought about slope in terms of angles. So, in terms of angles, the slope of every line is defined, okay? Even vertical lines have a slope. What is the slope of a vertical line? It's one right angle. Or in modern terminology, it's pi over two radians, or... 90 degrees. Of course, degrees are not fixed circular measures, so uh, you can have any number of degrees that you like in a circle. And uh, while we're on that topic, there are a lot of professors like Professor Jack Hazinger who doesn't understand that the trigonometric functions like sine, cos, tan, etc., uh, do not take anything but radians. But Mr. Gabriel, we've used degrees all the time. Well, no, that's not really what happens. When you, in your calculator, enter degrees, or you look it up in your tables, it first gets converted into radians, and then it gives you a ratio, which is equal to, in the case of sine, the opposite over the hypotenuse, and cos, the adjacent, etc. Okay, so uh, rise over run is really just the tan of theta. In this particular case, what Newton did was, when he was studying the slopes of lines, he used rise over run and not angles. So Newton used tan of minus, it's not, this means the inverse of tan, instead, I'm sorry, Newton used tan theta instead of tan minus theta or arc tan theta, okay? So he decided that he was gonna think about slope in terms of rise over run. Now, what does this tell you? So if you have zero rise, then you have a horizontal line, right? So as it starts to increase, this ratio will increase. Isn't, isn't that so? So that once you get to 90 degrees, you'll have um, a slope that's essentially undefined because there is no run. So from zero degrees all the way up to 90, it increases, and then suddenly <clears throat> at 90, it's no longer defined. But it is defined in terms of angles. It's exactly pi over two radians, okay? So <clears throat> if you're able to calculate rise over run, then you are able to calculate the slope of a line in terms of tan theta, or 
the way that Newton uh, decided to investigate slopes. Okay, so, and I'll explain that in a moment too. Now, rise over run is simply a given number up here and a given number up here. These numbers here are not changes in anything. They're actually finite differences, okay? So when you say, for example, y2 minus y1, there's nothing changing there. That's completely idiotic to even think of it that way, okay? Nothing's changing at all. All you're doing is you're putting a finite difference in there. This is called a finite difference, all right? And the same thing with the x, all right? You put it in here, it's also a finite difference. Nothing is changing in terms of x. And of course, if you have finite difference over a finite difference, this is called a ratio of finite differences or finite differences or a difference quotient, okay? Or a difference quotient. That's, and this is what it means. So now a finite difference is really just a differential. A differential is something like dy and dx, okay? And then a ratio of differentials is a finite difference quotient. And if it's defined properly as it is in the new calculus, it also happens to be the derivative. But in your kluge mainstream calculus, you have to imagine that there's uh, a convergent series of finite differences so that this converges to a limit, okay? So, um, let's just clear this out now. And look at what Newton was trying to do. So, this is what Newton was investigating. He was trying to find the slope of a line that is tangent to any given curve. <clears throat> that was his uh, problem. So Newton and Leibniz and all the others who came before me didn't have a clue of how to find the slope here. So they just began to experiment. They drew a secant line like that, and they said, ooh, well, the slope of the secant line is definitely not the same as the tangent line. So what if we draw that secant line closer like this? Oh, we see that the finite different finite difference quotients, which are the slopes for these lines, are steadily approaching <clears throat> this finite difference, which is the slope of the tangent line, right? So uh, he came up with this formula, which is in fact the, the finite difference quotient, and I'm going to call it f dash like that, of xh. And of course, they soon realized that this was kludgy. There was a large controversy um, <clears throat> uh, because what, they, what this is actually equal to is it will give you <clears throat> The derivative, which is k plus some expression in x and h. Okay. <clears throat> the problem <clears throat> is for this to be equal to k, this here has to equal to zero. See that? Okay, this expression here must be zero, otherwise, <laughs> this isn't the derivative. And the monkeys in mainstream academia didn't realize this. It took a genius like me. To figure this out, okay? Nobody on planet Earth was able to figure this out before me. Okay, so you have to use this Kluge method in order to find k, and then you suddenly just drop these terms away, right? And that's the same as finding the limit, by the way. It doesn't matter that your fucking moron lecturers tell you things like this implies this. It's all just bullshit to get you to believe that this here actually defines it and it rigorizes it. It doesn't. First of all, this little L that you see here happens to be this K, okay? So in order to use this very finition in your real analysis course, you need to know the derivative, you fucking idiot. Did you get that? I'm using vitriol because there are morons out there who imagine that they can actually 
debate me. And I sometimes get comments that really annoy me and I would throttle the person if he was in front of me or I'd give him such a slap that never mind. Okay. Um, I know what I'm talking about and all of you are fucking idiots without any exception. Did you get that? Think about it, morons. <clears throat> okay. My calculus is the first and only rigorous calculus. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about your idiotic ideas a little bit more, okay? So now, so you have to have this equal to zero, but you can't have it equal to zero. You know why, moron? Because if this is zero, you get a difference quotient, which is zero over zero, and it's bullshit to begin with, okay? And you can't say that this is, the limit is the ultimate ratio. That's just verbal diarrhea that came out of Newton's mouth. And Newton was not as intelligent as I am. In fact, nobody before me possesses my intelligence. I am smarter than anybody else who came before me. Heck, I can prove it. Study my new calculus, you damn idiot and you'll realize that I know what I'm talking about, okay? Don't comment on my video unless you have studied my new calculus. Otherwise, you'll be a trashy fool like James Meyer or that hippie Dennis Muller of illogical fallacies or some other moron who's actually thought that they know better than me because they memorized some facts in real analysis. You wanna know something? I know real analysis better than anyone else on the planet. I dismissed it as garbage when I first studied it. And I sat through every single course of my real analysis. Um, every lecture, I, I attended every single lecture. I didn't even miss one. Okay? So I know what real analysis is all about. It's that topic about uh, an object, a mathematical object that doesn't exist, the real number. So your your mathematics that you study at university is really a total bunch of crap. And what I'm telling you right now is what is the real uh, calculus, okay? In other words, the stuff that you can actually understand and make sense because the new calculus is based on a rigor rigorous uh, analytic uh, formulation, analytic geometry formulation. <coughs> Excuse me. So you have to have this quotient here equal to zero, but it cannot be zero because then you don't even have a secant line anymore. You get it more on as the secant line approaches here. H cannot be zero because if H is zero, you don't even have a gradient. You have something that's undefined, right? It's bullshit. And now you may say, well, we can verify it using this. You can only verify it if you know it. And the only method you have to get it is a kludgy, crappy method given to you by Cauchy and Weierstrass and Newton and Leibniz. What I am giving you is a rigorous and sound method where, and now my, my, my new calculus uh, derivative says this, it says this, it will give you K plus Q of X, M, N, like that. And this here is always zero. It has to be zero because when I calculate the gradient of a tangent line like that, I use the derivative of a parallel secant line. And I'm gonna show you how all that works again not that I haven't shown you, but you're so fucking thick that I'm showing it to you again and again, okay? Till you get it. Eventually, hopefully, someday in the dis not too distant future, you might get it. Now, as you can see, it doesn't matter which of these parallel lines you consider, okay? You will always get the slope of the tangent line. And you cannot have this here uh, being anything but zero. Even in this form here, it has to be zero. It is zero when it's parallel. And once you find this expression here, and there's something here in X, M, and N, or just X, or, or nothing at all, it's fine. Because when you evaluate this expression, it will always be zero. So this here is called the auxiliary 
equation in the new calculus. Okay, it's the first brilliant feature you will encounter. How does this all work, you ask? Okay, well, let's see how. Let's go to this applet. Now, pay attention, moron. Pay attention, moron. Morons, I'm sorry, <laughs> plural. What you have here shows you that it doesn't matter what function you're using. All you do is you construct a couple of similar triangles like you see here, see? See that? Now uh, This here happens to be the derivative or the gradient of this tangent line. Doesn't matter where you move it, like that or like that. Now you can, nothing is approaching anything here. I'm just using the gradient of a parallel secant line. And I'll show you an example here on the right hand side. In this particular example, I've used the quadratic uh, equation, but it doesn't matter what is the equation here. This always works because of the geometry. See, look at it here. I am showing you that this difference quotient here will always give you the slope. Okay, so if you have anything in Q, X, M, N here, it will evaluate to zero. For example, in the case of the parabola, n is always equal to m. And guess what? Even Archimedes knew that. If you study the works of Archimedes, which most of you morons will probably not even be able to because you're just simply not smart enough, you will have realized that even Archimedes knew that n and m must be equal in the case of the parabola. And so if they're equal, this expression always evaluates to zero. Now you can try it with any other function you like. Try a cubic or uh, an exponential or a logarithmic function and you will see that the auxiliary equation always gives you zero. So in which case, even though um, m and n are never zero, when we get this, we can just set n and m is equal to zero in the case of the new calculus. You can't do it in your bogus calculus, okay? Why can't you do it? Because in your bogus calculus, you don't even have a finite difference when you get there. See, you don't have it. It's just bullshit. But in the new calculus, you've always got a parallel tangent line, okay? So effectively, you can set this to zero because it is always zero and it's proved in the new calculus using sound analytical geometry. And the proof is simply this. M plus N is always a factor of this expression. Okay. So you can read it, read this up even on my website or in one of the many articles that I've written. And you'll hopefully, if you have an open mind, understand that this is the way to uh, find the derivative of a function. And <clears throat> what I've shown you here now is <clears throat> the way you compute a derivative in the new calculus and how it came about. It's just the rise over the run. That's all it is, rise over run. And because these are similar triangles, these portions here will not change the value of the slope. You see that? It doesn't matter if I add them in or subtract them. This is all based on book five and proposition 12. Now. <clears throat> I have also given a new definition of the integral. And perhaps if you're smart enough to get past this, you might find out the beauty of the new calculus integral, which is possible to calculate in a finite number of steps without using infinity, without using infinitesimals or the nonsense of limits. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. This is a new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel. Until next time, goodbye.